welcome to the discussion, Social Justice in Schools. Is our most important social institution sustainable? Question mark. What has happened to the Gonski plans under the current government and the labor opposition? Laurie Mulhern grew up in working class Sydney. He is president of the New South Wales Teachers Federation. And he's also, um, he's also a uh, deputy president of the Australian Education Union. He is, he, <coughs> excuse me, as a teenager he was heavily influenced by folk legend Peter Seeger. Seeger used his music to express his views on politics, the environment, and the labor movement. Laurie has made good use of them. We believe that the Gonski campaign, um, and we say this uh, absolutely uh, with hand on heart, we believe it's the most important social movement in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And I, and I have been involved in just about every social movement campaign in the last 30, 40 years. But this is a game changer, and it's also a game changer if we lose it. The Gonski Review um, is actually worth a read. It's actually quite readable. Um, 285 pages, 41 recommendations, 26 findings, released at 11 o'clock at 11.10, 10 minutes later Christopher Pine had rejected all 41 recommendations, all 26 findings and called it a con. Um, but uh, putting him aside, as we would like to, um, he's gone for a little while anyway. The Gonski, the Gonski campaign is really uh, a game changer for education if we can, if we can, if we can actually um, get it uh, implemented in its entirety. It's, uh, it was done, uh, the Gonski review of course was headed by the businessman David Gonski and uh, it was an enormously important piece of uh, social research and you, which you can see in the, in the finding. Uh, which confirmed what all teachers in public schools know is that we've been doing the heavy lifting but without the resources. That this country has deliberately, not accidentally, not by quirk of history, but by adults saying that some children ought to be advantaged over others and we'll implement policies that make that happen and we've been doing it for nearly 30 or 40 years. The God's Review finally shone a light on that, albeit a fairly faint light, but a light nevertheless for enough for us to galvanise the public education community, to wake the public education community, which in many ways has been asleep for, for too long on this issue of, of getting some funding back into our schools. We were facing a situation where 70% of Commonwealth money was going into the private education system. We've got one of the most segregated uh, education systems on the planet and other people in, the, in the other countries look at you with just amazement that the Australian community allowed it to happen, have and uh, allowed it to happen. And it's been, unfortunately, um, a, the major political parties have been part of that historic uh, um, uh, that situation. So, um, 7,000 submissions from schools, the union did a lot, large part in, 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 uh, in, in creating um, and uh, at the, and the, the findings, of course, were, were very clear. There is a growing gap in Australia between advanced students and disadvantaged students, and that gap is getting wider. That we are, we are permanently going to condemn a huge proportion of young people in this, in, in this country to never, ever uh, reaching their potential. Uh, it's not just the individual loss to that person, it's also the social, and I, indeed, despite neoliberalism, the economic cost. It doesn't even make economic sense to have lost that kind of, and what they would term human capital in this country. It doesn't make sense in any, any sense that we have effectively argued for the notion of choice, uh, which is largely parent-driven, choice over equality in our education system. So we've got a situation now where, um, uh, look at these kind of figures. 60% uh, of the most disadvantaged students are concentrated in schools with disadvantaged socioeconomic status. This is well above the OECD average and is substantially higher than just about any other OECD countries. In other words, we've got levels of concentration of disadvantaged in schools that other OECD countries simply do not have. So 
So the need is not just a, mat, a flat kind of rate need, it's an exponential need. The, the need to deal with this is, is, is far greater than just the statistics alone will tell you. We look at the, these kind of statistics that came out of the Gonski Review. 83% of, of the poorest 25% of children in this country, 83% of them go to public schools. 11% go to Catholic schools. 6% go to independent, other independent schools. 83, 11 and 6. And we really need to scotch this nonsense that the Catholic Church puts out that somehow uh, there's all these Irish Catholic children running around in bare feet eating bread and dripping and poor and everything. You know, the myth that they put around that somehow the Catholic Church are interested in poor kids. Because if they're interested in poor kids, they'd be funding Gonski. As the Vincent yeah. Paul report this week said, if you want to do something for poor Catholic kids and fund Gonski, because the majority of Catholic children are in public schools, Catholic schools have now been schools of social segregation. They are schools to assist in the white flight. That's why they exist, and that's their purpose. And they're not even, and they, and the greatest enrolment growth for the last, last ten years has come from non-Catholics. They're not even getting Catholics into their schools. They are schools for the middle class, and we ought to call it. And if we look at other areas, 85% uh, of Indigenous students in public schools, 78% of students with disability, 83% of kids in remote areas, the majority of students with English language difficulties in public schools, and over 90% of students in the new arrivals program are in public schools. It's a public system that is doing the heavy lifting, but without the recurrent funding to do it. And every teacher who works in the public system knows this because that's their daily bread each and every day. Jeff Masters talks about the steady decline in average performance and no reduction relationship between student performance and socioeconomic background. In other words, it's not getting better, he's saying. If we look at the school variance uh, and, and in terms of the difference between schools, it's, uh, it's risen to eight, from 18 to 24 per cent between 2000 and 2009, in countries like Finland it's 8 to 9%. In, in, in other words, there is a significant increase in the gap between low and high socioeconomic schools. And Australia is the only country to observe such an increase. And several countries they have recorded a significant decrease. Christina Ho from the University of Technology, who's published a, a great paper recently called People Like Our School Choice, Multiculturalism, Segregation in Sydney, has this to say. When she's looked at high schools in Sydney, it reveals a highly divided education system with some elite private schools operating as virtually monocultural bastions of whiteness, while public schools, including selective schools, are sometimes overwhelmingly dominated by students from language backgrounds other than English. She goes on to say schools are becoming more segregated in terms of both class and ethnicity. More and more students are going to schools that do not represent the range of people in their neighbourhood, rather a select group. Their families have chosen to enrol them in schools but there are more people like us. We, in Australia, bus kids to segregate schools. And in New South Wales alone, it spends nearly $500 million on the public transport scheme to bus kids past their public schools to other schools. America at least tried to use busing to integrate their schools. And we've done the exact opposite when we look at what we're doing in this country. I won't talk about the $250 million that uh, spent on the chaplaincy program. That's a, another whole kind of um, uh, annoyance. But, uh, but we see politicians who quite deliberately, and not all, I mean, there, there are exceptions, and Avery Pickley, for instance, in New South Wales, I think, gets it. Uh, but there are many politicians who go out of their way to perpetuate myths like the money doesn't matter myth that Eric Hanischek, the, the Stanford University economist in the 70s, created. And, and, and it's been repeated, and he, of course, is, is a darling of the right wing think tanks. The money doesn't matter. Class sizes doesn't, doesn't matter. This is, this is, of course, people who never teach in a school. And I say, if you want, class sizes don't matter. Go to a demountable classroom without air conditioning in Western Sydney in February with 30 kids in year nine and tell me that class sizes don't matter. And until you do that for a few years, I won't listen to what you've got to say because you're not talking the reality of what teachers face each and every day. The money doesn't matter me. Uh, the money doesn't matter me. I'm always intrigued by this, particularly by politicians who spend you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year on private school fees and then have the audacity to turn around and say money doesn't matter. 
you'd have to think, well, we, they're wasting their own money, if money doesn't matter. Christopher Pine put around the myth that there's been a 40% increase in funding for schools and we've got nothing as a country to show for it. And of course, we've got a compliant media, or a media that's so stretched and probably in, in, in terms of their uh, capabilities. That's probably a fairer way, because I think it's too easy to blame media and journalists. Journalists are hard-working people and professionals. But in many ways, they kind of repeat these mantras and they become a truth. 40% increase. I was, at a, uh, I was at a panel the other day and the, the facilitator said to me, but Maureen, there's been a 40% increase in schools funding and uh, we've got nothing to show for it. And you think, well, where did that question come from? Well, it came from this sort of capacity of politicians to put into in the nation's psyche the simple untruths. So we looked at the actual figures and figures that come from uh, both the National Accounts uh, and Productivity Commission statistics have shown this. This is the reality. Between 2000 and 2013, uh, so that's uh, almost a decade and a couple of years just prior to the beginning of the Gonski funding model, which began in 2014, from 2000 and 2013, the total school funding increase has been 6.68% actually in Australia, 6.68%, just slightly less than 7%. If you were to subtract it, um, actually increases cost of educational delivery, such as increase in teachers' salaries and, uh, and that kind of thing. And if you take enrolment growth out, that is, there's more kids, therefore there needs to be more schools and teachers, then what you're left with is not 40% or 30% or 10% or 5%. You're not even left with 1%. The actual increase between 2000 and 2013 in, in fact, increase per student in funding is 0.97%. Less than 1% in this country. Australia is one of the lowest, we are one of the lowest countries in terms of investing in education of any OECD country. Yet you'll see politicians gabbing on about the nation, we've got to be a competitive nation um, while they, they, they sign free trade agreements um, at the same time. And economic growth for the same period is 1.48%. We We became a wealthier nation, but we spent less than 1% on funding increase. But it gets worse than that because that funding increase largely went to the already advantaged. We're spending money on the already advantaged. And that's what we've been doing until Gonski came along. Gonski is not a perfect model. The model is, 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 is uh, worth defending and campaigning for. It's the best we're going to get and I, and I would suggest that we don't get it then there will never be a government with any courage that will introduce a third or fourth kind of model. This is, this is the, the one we have to fight for. The model is quite simple in its, um, how it um, operates, or is meant to operate. And it's worth remembering what the architecture is, because we have to defend the actual architecture. The architecture is basically this. There will be a base loading uh, for every student enrolled in schools. 100% um, of that base load will go to public schools and then there'll be a sliding schools for non-government schools depending on their capacity to raise revenue themselves. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there will be additional loadings uh, for Indigenous students, poor students, stu schools in remote, small schools, students from non English speaking ground, background and students with disability. In other words, those what we might call equity areas. And they, uh, they are fairly complex models, but they go to give, giving schools exactly what they uh, should be, what they need, in a sense, to, to, uh, to uh, educate the, prof the enrolment profile within their schools. The model is essentially saying this. Both state and Commonwealth have to kick in. The notion that you can just have state governments responsible for schooling, school, funding schooling, while the Commonwealth has responsible for non-government school, all that has done in this country is meant that the, the, the level of government with the greatest capacity to raise revenue have looked after private schools. Mm -hmm. And the states that, that don't have any real serious revenue raising capacity are left to do with health and transport and school systems, the, the big, the, big uh, 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 the most expensive areas, if you like, of government expenditure. And Gonski was saying, no, 65% of the money has to come from the Commonwealth, 35% of the state, and the Commonwealth has to grow their contribution at 4.7%, has to grow at a higher indexation rate, and the states are still going to grow there. Stop the cuts, grow your funding each year at 3%. Bring all schools within uh, six years, 
This is why the six year campaign that you might have heard about is so important to us. Bring all schools up to a minimum resource standard, not a maximum. We're not interested in the archery courses or the 11 cricket fields that Kings might have out at Parramatta. We're not interested in those. We are interested though in getting um, uh, uh, equipment with braille for kids who are visually impaired. We're interested in getting um, teachers aids in the class. We're interested in building ramps for kids in wheelchairs. That money is, is particularly important, but we're bringing all school up to a minimum resource standard after six years. But this is the critical part. It's recurrent funding, and once you bring schools up to that resource standard in six years, you, both levels of government, must maintain, must maintain their commitment in perpetuity so that no school ever drops beneath the, the, the resource standard. Now, that's a, a fairly simple model. But it's incredibly, it's much fairer than what we've got now, or what we had before Gonski came in, which is a Commonwealth Government's funding scheme where public schools weren't even included in it. We're not included in it. The Commonwealth funding scheme was essentially a funding scheme how you put money into private schools. So this is a game changer. It's a serious game changer for what uh, we can uh, do in, in, in Australia. So, um, at the moment we have um, uh, the, the coalition government in uh, power in Canberra under um, Abbott and Pine, of course, they did the big, pulled the big swifty in September 2013 the, or August 2013, just prior to the federal election where they said they're on a unity ticket with the ALP um, and of course they weren't. They were funding four years, which is about a third of what was actually uh, promised by the, for the six year transition funding. And of course, since then, they have done their best uh, to, to uh, white hand the cost of the funding model. They, they spent a lot of time uh, going around the coalition states, bar New South Wales, attempting to white hand it. And uh, one thing that it shows, the, the, I suppose, how callous, uh, how callous the, 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 they are, is the student with disability loading. That student with disability loading, we're talking with, about children that are, that are physically disabled, we're talking about children with intellectual disability, and we're talking about children with some of very, very complex needs. And uh, there was meant to be a, uh, the loading was meant to be introduced by 2015, then 2014 collecting the data so there's consistency across the states, what they do in South Australia in terms of definitions is different to Queensland, this is get, get a national consistent kind of set of data that gives us a give us something to fund our schools by, that has not happened. There's, so the money for student disability will run out and uh, this year. There's no, there's no student disability loading. And we look, we're looking at potentially, we believe, just on uh, Commonwealth data alone, about 127,000 kids, students with disability, who will receive not one single dollar of, of money uh, in, in their schools and, and, and no hope. For all schools and for all kids after 2017, when the fourth year finishes, um, currently uh, under the coalition federally, it, uh, there's, no, there's no money. Only The only increase that will happen after 2017 will be CPI increase, CPI increase and enrolment uh, growth. But CPI has never ever been anywhere near what actual school costs are, so that will effectively be a very serious cut to schools funding across the board. And uh, that's the coalition. At the moment, the opposition, the ALP has committed in the policy platform to a needs-based Gonski model, and that's good, but it's not, not really good enough. I mean, really, we need the ALP to come out and make not just a, that kind of, yes, we support needs-based funding, yes, it's in our DNA, that's fine to say that. But unless you fund that school resource standard, that school resource standard has a dollar tag attached to it, unless you fund that and put the money up, then in many ways, we're very fearful that Turnbull will go something. What Turnbull will do will come out, make an announcement um, that will be a watered down or, or, or a very different kind of Gonski model. The Gonski brand is now so firmly um, in, entrenched in the, in the community's mind that uh, politicians are using the word Gonski to describe things that aren't uh, the, the essential Gonski uh, model. So we're, f we're very fearful of that and that's the, that's the situation that we find ourselves um, in, in politically. 
But um, at the moment, the, the good news is that at least the state coalition government um, in New South Wales, in their Ford estimates, have funded the full six. Will fund the full six years, and that's the coalition government. And uh, and I guess you've got to actually give credit where credit's due. They have put into their forward estimates for the full six years because we're now into that into the second year of it. So if you look at a four-year quadrennial funding cycle, you can see that they had to have it in this year's budget and it's there. And they have, and Baird is on the record saying that yes they are still committed and will fund their share of the full transition funding. But of course it's not from the Commonwealth. So uh, we need this essentially once and for all for schools funding to be something that's about party politics uh, in this nation. Uh, uh, the union campaign is that uh, we are sick of our kids missing out and, uh, and, and teachers being scapegoated um, and public schools being criticised and condemned when they haven't been given the resources uh, that they need. Despite all of this, despite all of this, just about every academic study that we can cite, and we've looked at about um, 30 studies over the last 15 years uh, in Australia, and uh, those studies all show that people sending their children to private schools are not giving their children any academic advantage. Yes. There is, they, yes. There's no academic yes, advantage. That's it. That's it. There's no academic advantage. Yeah, despite that, uh, so you'd have to see what's the other reason for that to happen. And it really does go to the parents who essentially don't want their children mixed with other British children. And they, and they can come up with any excuse they like, you know, you know, the, you know the, my wife is Catholic, my husband's Catholic, my grandparents said they wouldn't, they'd lose out of the will if we didn't do it. Whatever you want to do, but essentially what we've created is a segregated society which panders to adult fears and adult kind of wishes, not to what children's needs are. And that's effectively what we've done in the education system in Australia. And other countries, many other countries look aghast that we can have a system where we can fund uh, uh, faith-based schools, allow them to be exempted from discrimination legislation, but also allow them to refuse to enrol children in the local community, and yet still fund them. And under the current funding model of the coalition government, if they if get their way, Gonski is not introduced and their funding that they're saying they're going to do in 2018. Our data shows that by 2019, both the Catholic and private schools funding, government funding at a state and level and Commonwealth combined funding will exceed that of public schools. By 2019, we're on a trajectory, according to the research of Chris Bonner and Bernie Shepherd, that if we do not turn things around in this country, our non-government system will be receiving more government money than the government school system. Other countries get told that, then you get a million people on the streets. Exactly. What's the percentage of enrolments in government versus non-government? The enrolment each share is about 70-30, uh, it depends in primary and secondary, but that's uh, effectively uh, the, the, the shift. What we are saying, though, that uh, that the uh, Gonski funding model is the great historical compromise because it doesn't remove funding. As, as when Gillard set up the Gonski review, one of the one of the things they were fearful of was the Mark Latham, what they call the Mark Latham scare of taking you know dollars off private schools. So that one of the things that uh, that in many ways um, hamstrung the Gonski review was he wouldn't have to do have a redistribution model. They had to actually go for additional funding. And so, because um, uh, no school was to lose a dollar, so uh, that effectively is, is, is what it is. But at least it is sector blind in terms of how the money is allocated, and it is truly needs based. So there are some positive elements of it. And I'll finish on this um, quote from um, one Malcolm Turnbull who um, today said, when he asked a question about whether he'd kick in the full funding. Uh, because uh, the Gonski, um, the Gonski uh, we had a tweet-a-thon uh, a couple of nights ago, and it, and it, be, it um, trended as number one across, across Australia. So it's out there. We've got 148,000 people signed up for the I Give a Gonski website, which is stronger than, bigger than GetUp. 
So it's a big social movement out there. But this is what Turnbull said, and I'll finish on this point. It depends on what you mean by Gonski funding. I mean, it's... Dana Gonski's report focuses on needs-based funding in schools. Everyone agrees with that, says Malcolm Turnbull. The question is the level of funding and the affordability of it. But I can assure you that all of us are committed to ensuring that we get the best education outcomes for our children. But clearly, in these tough budgetary times, affordability is an issue. Affordability is an issue. I mean, really. I'm saying, the Prime Minister of Australia is saying, saying now that this nation cannot afford to educate its children but can send an air force over to Syria. Right on. Right on.